My name is Ben Dunn. I'm an environmental technologist with Verge Permaculture, among other things behind the scenes. Um, and today I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by Becky Doherty, who is the owner and operator of Stone Post Farms. Um, that's a regenerative farm located here in central Alberta, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with, with her farm in this area. Um, Becky is also a past graduate of our permaculture design certification course, uh, which is how we first got connected with her. Um, and since then, she's um, been working closely with us and is actually now going to be teaching uh, some of the livestock component of our upcoming permaculture design course. Um, and that's that's generally the conversation that we want to have today as well, is, is an introduction to livestock, livestock management, um, you know, the influence of, of permaculture and some of her farming practices. Um, and so... I'll kick it over to, to Becky to, you could say a few words about yourself and your farm and uh, maybe what, what got you into farming in the first place. Hi, yes, thank you very much for the intro and having me on here. Um, so yeah, we, we got started more or less, I'm from BC and I married a farm boy from Alberta. Uh, we met in university, so it was kind of always his dream to be a farmer. And I was a country girl, um, so that was quite appealing to me. So we had worked in industry, mainly oil and gas, for several years coming out of university and kind of started just to get that itch to, you know, get out of the urban center and, you know, start something of our own. So about seven years ago, uh, we moved west of Edmonton about an hour and a half and we started our farm. Uh, Stone Post Farms, and our kind of focus was looking at direct marketing, and that's kind of the initial way we got into it. We thought that would probably be the best way to um, essentially be able to establish ourselves and make enough money to run a farm, um, as it's really not easy to do these days. It's quite expensive. Um, and as we kind of got into direct marketing and really started to like uh, learn how to market ourselves and understand our values and stuff like that. We kind of connected in with like the regenerative movement. Uh, we really like some of the the information that uh, people like Joel Salatin and Gabe Brown were kind of talking about, as well as um, on the gardening side a little bit with Jean Martin and a few others like that. And it kind of just <clears throat> more or less started snowballing into what we have today. Um, but as we kind of learned a little bit more about soil health and kind of how that all connects, and that's a bit where permaculture almost came into it as well. And we did some more of the marketing, market garden side of things as well. Um, so I kind of fell into the permaculture hole and came across the PDC and was really, really intrigued by it and really quite liked it because um, it wasn't permaculture like I see on Facebook where it's very much urban and garden focused. It was more the whole system, you know, there was livestock, there was the whole area. Um, you're looking at all these different aspects, which I really came to appreciate because for us, that that was kind of a, a very core component of our farm was everything needed to work together um, and be kind of a, a closed system almost and supporting different elements supporting themselves. Um, so one element wasn't on its own, it was kind of serving multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how we we really got started. Um, <clears throat> I did work on the farm full time. Um, me and my husband have now switched roles. So I work full time off the farm, um, but kind of in a related field in agriculture research and applying mm -hmm. um, research um, onto farms, essentially. So connecting uh, peer research that's coming out of universities or elsewhere and then adopting it you know to our region and locality and mm. this is different practices you know we're kind of on the soil health end of it too so everything just really ties in really neatly which is kind of neat so um, yeah <laughs> yeah that's exciting I really hope that we have some time later to get into to some of that um that work that you're doing connecting research to farms because that's something I'm I'm really interested in as well as how we can uh kind of bridge that interface between regenerative agriculture and, and public opinion to show people that this actually works and it's making a difference and we need to be looking at this. And so um, 
Yeah, maybe my next question is, is what, what separates your farm from a typical uh, livestock operation? So there's multiple different ways. Um, typical farms in our area, uh, either um, not direct marketing or maybe they're doing it a little bit on the side. Um, so we're set up, we do inspected meat, um, like the full nine yards, we market it, we do deliveries. And that's a, a core focus of our farm. Um, we do still sell into the commodity market with calves. Um, that does still make up a large proportion of our income. Um, and we're still reviewing whether or not that's a route we want to continue going or if we move away mm -hmm. from it. Um, and then other ways in which we're a little bit different, you know, when we're looking at the commodity side of it is we're still really focusing on um, kind of the grass fed grass finished we don't we don't supplement with grain or anything like that so they're out on pasture their whole lives um, we try and mimic more of the natural cycle so when we calve we're calving more in um, the late spring so like may june versus a lot of commercial producers which are more like the february march struggling with the mm -hmm. you know winter season and then looking more at like the rotational grazing side of it, um, we are seeing rotational grazing um, gain a little bit more momentum and popularity um, in the livestock industry, which is really good. Um, but yeah, that's one of our focuses. We do it with all of our livestock. So we're, um, we're moving our pigs around. We have chicken tractors. We have a turkey bus that's out in the pasture, and then we graze our cattle around as well. So, so and then bale maybe, grazing versus rolling out every day or silage. Yeah, well, I was going to say maybe you can define what what rotational grazing is yeah. for people who in the audience don't know, and then what are some of the benefits of that compared to typical methods? Absolutely. Uh, so. Uh, very conventionally grazing is just you let your cows out into a field uh, maybe it's a quarter section half section and they just kind of graze it all summer it becomes very patchy and um, with rotational grazing there's different variations of it you may hear mob grazing or a few other or adaptive grazing they're all kind of subsets of rotational grazing but it's essentially making a smaller pen um, that you move throughout your field. So you're kind of condensing the cattle into one area and then moving them. So for example, uh, you, you um, separate your field into paddocks. Maybe it's using an electric fence, maybe it's permanent fencing. And say your cattle stay in a pen for one day, maybe it's two days, maybe it's five days, and then you move them. And what that does is uh, usually cattle will just kind of take one kind of bite off the top of the plant and that's kind of what you're going for and then they're also uh, dropping manure kind of trampling stuff in and then you move them so you're not overstaying and compacting but you're trampling down some organic matter which gets into your soil uh, you're fertilizing it in a little more uniform because they're so condensed it's uniform over the area and then you're not overgrazing because they're just taking that one bite and moving on um, and so you get usually a little healthier soils, uh, better water retention, uh, healthier grasses because you're not overgrazing. And so it can actually improve your pastures and give you more forage and feed for your cattle over time if you're doing it properly. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. That was a, a very, a very well-rounded and detailed <laughs> explanation. Um, oh, I totally lost my next question. I guess um, I would say how much... <laughs> Has, has permaculture in, informed um, the, the, the design and, and the management of, of your operations? Because you had started Stone Post Farms before you took a permaculture design course, right? Yes. So what changed yeah. after that? So one of the big changes is just kind of, instead of just making a decision on, you know, doing something different with the cattle or doing something different with the pigs or the garden, we're kind of looking at, okay, we want to do this with, say, the garden. How can we use that? Um, and how does it affect all the other elements we have on our farm? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when we're looking at the rotational grazing, we kind of, you know, we're reviewing it. Okay, how many passes do we want to do? Are we able to also include like our pigs or our chickens into it? Um, it just kind of gives a, a better overall 
perspective and you're thinking about different things versus just like really narrowly focused in um, on one item. And then if we're going to like build something, how can we use it for more than one purpose or yeah, yeah. how can it affect different things at the same time? So it's not just, we're only doing this for the cows. Oh, can we use this for our chickens? Can we use it for our pigs? Or can we implement something with the garden? You know, so just, yeah, kind of a broader perspective on thinking on planning things out and, and yeah. how everything interacts. Yeah, great. Um, how did you get started for anybody who's who's listening to this podcast and thinking oh you know I'm you know I have a bit of land you know I have five you know maybe ten maybe full quarter section uh and I want some livestock what's what's the best way to get started what kind of livestock are are best for me <laughs> that's a very loaded question and I'm gonna say it depends um yes but it it really does so I guess a lot of it is like knowing what your values are and what your goals are for the land and understanding time commitments. Um, typically the smaller the animal, the more time they're going to take, but the bigger the animal, the bigger the investment up front. Um, so it's, it kind of depends, you know, what do you want to get out of it? Um, you know, what kind of capital do you have to invest? Um, mm -hmm. What is your overall goal for that land? You know, are you just trying to feed yourself and like your family? Are you trying to make an income on it? Um, and there's, you know, there's other ways to do it too. You can lease out your land or you can kind of work with someone who doesn't have access to the land if you don't have the time or the money. So like there's a lot of different ways to kind of get what you want, but it's understanding what you want first before you go down that road. And yeah. I would always say start smaller and then like make sure you like it before you go big uh, because it's hard. It's hard once you're in the middle of it. Um, I would venture to say we probably bit off more than we can chew and we're still kind of trying to grapple with that and figure out, you know, really where we want to go and trying to hone in on that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's a very, I think that's, that's important to recognize, you know, with, with most things, it's, there's not going to be a really quick and easy, you know, way that everybody should get started with livestock or should get started with permaculture in a broader sense. It really depends on what, what your vision and values are, what your goals, what you want to accomplish. And so the first step with livestock isn't to buy livestock, it's to think about <laughs> what your goals are with the land in your life. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's I think that's really important. Um, I'm curious to know what have or ha has been the most rewarding aspect of doing what you do for a livelihood. Um, I I really like raising our kids out here. Um, we have a lot of friends that live in urban centers and even like more specifically looking over the last two, three years on, you know, what's been happening, like just having this land that we, you know, we can do, you know, whatever we want. The kids can go out and play for hours and, um, their imaginations roam wild. So like that is really important to us is, you know, giving them that opportunity to grow up on a farm. Um, and teaching them the values, you know, how to respect life, um, how to grow your own food, how is it all done? I think those are really, really important values that a lot of people in urban areas have really lost that connection. And so really yeah. honoring that connection and being able to pass it down through the generations. Um, and then just being able to share uh, quality food and tell our story and educate people um, on their food has been really rewarding. Um, we get some really fantastic feedback that quite makes our day. Um, you know, your food's amazing. Um, yeah, I've never tasted something so good. Um, and just having that appreciation for people that you are doing a good job. And then just being able to go to our freezer and grab whatever we want at any point in time and knowing we're having like pretty much the best food out there so <laughs> yes, amazing. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to know what kind of what kind of feedback you've received from from your customers um along the way has it been 
you know, are, are they noticing a big difference in, in the quality of food and, and, you know, their feeling of healthfulness after, you know, eating your animals versus another farms? Um, absolutely. Um, one of my husband's biggest accomplishments has been turning a person who was vegan into eating meat again. Nice. <laughs> but like, <laughs> you know, with that, it's just being able to like confirm to people like, you know, literally our saying is like our animals have one bad day and that's it. Um, yeah. And so people kind of connect with that message. It is slightly dark, but at the same time, it's also a very clear message like you know we treat our animals with respect and they are eating the best and we make sure we have really good quality and if people go away for like a month or they didn't buy our stuff all winter and they came to market and got our eggs for instance they're like oh man I missed your eggs like these don't compare in flavor to what you get at the store so true yeah, or your steaks have like this incredible flavor to them whereas you know the ones I buy from the store are quite bland you know, once you get used to that flavor, your chicken is so moist and has so much flavor compared to when I buy, you know, say the, the six pack at Costco or whatever. So yeah, they notice the flavor, they notice the quality, our vegetables, same thing, like our tomatoes, mm. you know, they're completely different flavor from a store and, and people recognize that. So they're starting to kind of put that, that picture together. Yeah. And in terms of, um, your your quality because to have to, to run you know a profitable livestock operation if we're thinking from the perspective of someone who wants to do this you need to be on the farm full time like that that is your life so I'm curious to know how you would compare the quality of life that you have now compared to before owning a farm before having a livestock operation we definitely were not as connected to our food um like we were like, we always knew where our food came from. John grew up on a farm. Um, ever since we started dating, we always, we hunt every year um, and had a small garden, but it just gave us that much more appreciation for what it takes to, you know, say get meat on our plate, you know, going buying a chicken versus like growing it and the different flavor profile. Um, and just like better control over what we're eating. Um, like now that we're, we're away from urban areas that like we can't just order skip the dish or yeah. hello fresh so like we've had to learn how to to cook every cut and to try and utilize everything you know from making bone broth um you know after we cook our chicken or our turkey or um learning how to cook roasts properly and then like use utilizing all of it like the leftovers and everything mm. so like I'll cook a meal and it'll last us a week kind of thing. Um, and just makes us kind of experiment a little bit more. Like when we order seeds, I try and order the most random things in the seed catalog and try and nice. grow them and then learn how to cook them. Um, so that's kind of been a lot of fun is just more or less trying to experiment a whole bunch more and learn how to be more self-sufficient and trying to cut back on buying from a grocery store, to be honest, um, that's mm. gotten really expensive lately. So it, it has <laughs> <laughs> significantly. So like this year, yeah, we're making our own tomato sauce and pasta sauces and canning all of those and slowly by slowly trying to be more self-reliant, um, for both, yeah, to be economic and just to be self-reliant as well. Yeah. I love that. Um, how, how quickly I'm, I'm just going rapid fire questions because I just, I'm so curious. <laughs> um, how soon after, well, I should make that assumption. I guess how, how receptive was your customer base to the products you were offering? Were they, you know, was everybody really keen to start buying regeneratively farmed meat you know did it take you a long time to get to a place where you're like okay this is this is financially viable this is sustainable you know to meet our our goals economically um or, or would you say it's it's been a struggle like i'm thinking for someone who is wanting to get into this they're not sure if they're going to be successful or not they're making that investment with animals at the beginning um you know is is the market there for this yeah so if you're looking kind of yeah if as like a bit of an income side of it and looking at the direct marketing aspect of it, it's definitely been a challenge. Um, our biggest challenge has been 
probably more on the the pork and the poultry side of things um <clears throat> just more or less due to these animals do need grain um as part of their diet to to essentially get all the nutrients they need it's a little different than than running cattle or, or sheep or goats mm -hmm. you definitely can raise them on grass but you want to make sure you know you've got some other things in the mix so like you've planted some stuff you know maybe you, you've broadcasted oats in there and peas and stuff like that because they do have a different nutritional requirement so for us because we're direct marketing, we do need to make sure we're hitting certain targets. So we need to know our pork is going to be ready at a certain time to be able to sell it and have it ready for market. Mm -hmm. So we were buying um, grain mixes um, that met all their nutritional requirements. So we knew, you know, come July, we would be able to have them at butcher uh, ready weight. Um, and grain was really expensive. That was one of our big hindrances the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but we did get creative. Uh, we worked with um, a local brewery, actually, and we take all of their spent grain mm -hmm. and we feed that back to our pigs. So we eliminated needing to buy grain um, wow. by doing that. Chickens, we do still buy grain. They do need a lot more protein, especially when you're talking about meat birds. They're also out on grass. So like we are able to cut back on the amount of grain that we use because they are eating grass at the same time. But again, it's that we need to have them ready to around eight to 10 weeks um, so that we know that we've got them ready to sell at certain times. And same with turkeys. Um, if you do it just on grass, they do need some sort of protein content in there and it just takes a little bit longer to put on the weight. Um, so, Inputs was definitely a bit of a challenge for us, sourcing the right inputs from where we want to get them. Um, a big thing, we were trying to go more the organic route, but a lot of the organic grain mills import all their nutrients, um, like the, the different, <clears throat> I guess, additives they add with the grain to make sure they're, they're reaching their optimal nutrition. They bring them in from China. And so China doesn't follow organic standards like we do here, but there's kind of a loophole. So like learning about things like that is kind of frustrating uh, on one end. So we went more the local route than the organic route. Um, so we were supporting local farmers. Um, and then processing was, a, was another big issue. Um, and that's definitely a big one that you have to watch out for, especially in the poultry side. Um, for us, it's either uh, using some Hutterite barns will do processing for you and are licensed for it. Our closest one is Pigeon Lake. Um, and that's mm -hmm. the closest one for a lot of people in central to northern Alberta. Um, mm -hmm. So understanding, you know, where you can even get it done um, has been a, a big challenge. And then on our, our pork and beef side, um, just finding the right processor that would match the quality we needed on a consistent basis. We haul two hours to get to the right wow. person to do the right job. We have one that's 45 minutes away, but they consistently wouldn't meet the quality we needed and didn't really want to work with, mm. I guess, our type direct marketers because we are pickier. Right. Um, so processing, definitely a huge challenge. Now, um, the government of Alberta has made fairly big strides, I would say, um, in the last, I guess it would be probably two years now, they've opened up on-farm slaughter, and they are slowly refining those rules a little bit to make it a little easier for us to move animals. Um, before it'd be like whole animals had to go to one person, so hmm. you could only buy one beef. You couldn't split it with someone. You had to buy the whole beef from me, which is kind of not really realistic. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they're trying to work with us a little bit on that. Um, it is re relatively new, but it does open a lot of doors. So yeah. that's kind of been a really nice um, game changer. But then you have to learn how to do the slaughter yourself, cut and wrap yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, where, where's Alberta at with, with on-farm slaughter? Is that legal? It is legal. So I, I want to say it was last February um, they announced it. Um, so like one whole fam where one person could buy up to six beef a year. 
um, I forget how many pigs, but it was somewhere around six or so. And I think it was up to 150 chickens annually. Mm. Um, so essentially me as a producer, if you wanted to order a bunch of chickens, I could slaughter them on site for you. Um, I can, if you choose to, I can also, you know, uh, butcher them. Um, if it's a pig, I can cut it up for you, or you can take it and take it to an abattoir and they can cut mm. it up for you. There's a few options there. Um, and then as the producer, I have to submit a slaughter report to the government to say, I sold this beef to Ben and five chickens to Ben. And then I sold another pig to Jen and she took two turkeys. Mm -hmm. And then you submit that. Um, it's been pretty, pretty good. We've done a little bit of that. We did all of our turkeys last year. Uh, on farm slaughter we probably won't ever do that again but no, why not <laughs> it's a lot of work um yeah. yeah yeah I think we did like a hundred and we brought uh John and his dad did it over a course of a week and it's it's a lot of work yeah, yeah I can only imagine <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. yeah I've never had the experience of actually culling an animal myself other than fish while, while fishing but I feel like that's a really like I, I eat meat you know I animals are killed on on my behalf that I consume and so I feel like at least once in my life I want to be a part of that process and just you know kind of experience that circle of life much more viscerally yeah we have a few customers that were really on board with wanting to be there um like they've ordered a pig and so they wanted to be on site with John when um, we, we just use a 22 while they're eating grain, mm. very simple and quick. Um, yeah. and then they're there and he walks them through when he's, you know, hangs it up, when he guts it, skins it. Um, so they're kind of part of it without having to actually do it yourself. Um, because it is very different to do it yourself. Mm. Um, I made a point of, uh, I think it was like five years ago when we were hunting to do everything from shooting right down to cutting the steak and wrapping it and did a whole deer myself it's yeah it's very different and yeah mm. <laughs> it's an experience okay yeah so you know we've talked about the management of of your farm a little bit we've talked about how you got into it um talked about some rewarding aspects of um you know living the lifestyle that you do for, for your children for your family um, we recently interviewed the owners of what they call it? grass graze, the grass graze team in the United States, um, at Derek and Paige Jackson. And they posed an interesting question that I want to pose to you. Uh, and that is what has been your worst day as a farmer? Again, thinking from the perspective of someone getting into this, you know, it's not all you talked about some of the challenges, but what's been like the the worst thing that you've had to deal with? A uh, loss, uh, animal loss on the farm, and it's on us. Like it was a management error and animals died because of it needlessly. Mm -hmm. So like one example, like turkeys are an abs absolute, the hardest animal to raise. Um, not to say they're not smart, but they're very challenging. Um, you know, if it's raining, they're in the, like we had them in the chicken tractors at younger ages, um, they'd stand out in the rain and get pneumonia and die. Like, they wouldn't move into the covered part. Hmm. And so they're a very challenging one. But, you know, this happened recently. So we, we have a school bus we now put them in at night. And then we have electric netting around the bus that they graze during the day. And they're quite big. And so the netting we thought would be enough of a deterrent to keep like coyotes and such out. And so the door got left open one night and we lost eight turkeys um, like that. They just came in and grabbed them. Um, when we were first raising chickens, um, we didn't have chicken tractors. And so we just had a big grazing pen and we would have ravens just come and like eat their heads off and they would do 20 at a time. Um, you know, in a rainstorm in early spring, mm -hmm. we would lose calves because we, you know, didn't go out and check every single hour, you know, throughout the night. And so you go out and find wow. one. So 
animal loss is is a, a tricky one and it's hard not to take personal it's like oh if I would have gotten up and gone and checked it would have been okay um there's always these like what ifs and you always second guess but that's also part of farming and something you just have to be ready to deal with because you can't be everywhere at once it's gonna happen you're gonna make mistakes and it's kind of taking those mistakes and trying to to better your process so you know with the chickens we went from a uh, open area to closed tractors and we limited our loss like dramatically so you know we shuffled our, our our calving process so that we weren't having to get up every single hour and still possibly miss something um mid-may seems to be a pretty optimal time and we very rarely lose anything now so it's yeah being prepared for those and just instead of shaming yourself and feeling guilty um learning from it and how to do better yeah yeah what, what's beautiful about what you're saying though is you know despite those those challenges and that loss um you know your relationship with the animal is is one where you just have a stronger appreciation for it for its life you know that that creature as as a, a being you know not just an, an inventory item or a resource like yeah. Uh, you know, we lost this profit. It's like, no, you know, we lost a life needlessly for, for your words. And I think that's, that's what we get with the regenerative agriculture approach versus the industrial agriculture approach where, you know, these are creatures that, that we respect and, and we love and we have a relationship with um, versus them just being locked in, in a giant barn or a feedlot and, you know, it's just, it's just another number. Yeah. No, I agree with you for sure. Yeah. Um, so how maybe to kind of steer things toward, toward the close, um, how, how receptive are other farmers to methods of regenerative agriculture and maybe permaculture principles more widely? Is this something that they're thinking about and wanting to do, but they, they can't because they're they're trapped in debt and their you know equipment and current you know just the infrastructure they have. Or tell us a bit more about that. So we are like seeing a lot of people kind of take interest, at least in certain aspects, and we're also seeing the governments taking a little more interest at, in that as well. Um, like there's a lot of funding now being offered um, in terms of kind of more the the climate and carbon side of things. And so for example, uh, right now, there's uh, really good grants out there for rotational grazing equipment. Mm -hmm. And so opportunities like that, I do find really, really helpful. Um, so like for us, we're gonna try and upgrade, you know, all of our electric fencing, um, get better water systems so we can start doing a little bit um, tighter rotational grazing periods. Um, we just haven't had the the time or the capacity to get down to we want to be doing one day moves and mm -hmm. for that that's been a challenge for us with all the other stuff we do so it's nice to see governments are taking an interest and trying to to provide funding for producers and so we are seeing a lot of that um, that type of uh, funding come available and I'll shamelessly plug like what I do at my job um, because it does make a big difference. Um, you know, we put on one of our main focuses of, of where I work is extension. And what extension is, is, you know, providing opportunities for producers to come and learn, whether it's hmm. through a workshop or maybe it's an on-farm demonstration at one of our producers we're working with. Or, you know, we're holding virtual sessions and we've got those saved on our computer and we're trying to showcase these these newer techniques or you know different ways of growing things so that other farmers see it and then they want to try it um mm. a lot of what we do is try and take the risk and mitigate it for farmers by showing it we have test locations or we work with producers to implement something and we take the cost out of it and then we share their story um because it's hard to do something new uh, when no one else yeah. is doing it in the area. So um, associations like ours are kind of trying to help bridge that gap. And there's been a lot of soil health, kind of the regenerative 
type angle um, going around all of our associations. And there's 12 of them across our province actually, um, where we all do kind of the same thing. And so they are worthwhile kind of connecting with. And what is, what is the name of those associations? So we're called right now Applied Research Associations. So mine is West Central Forge Association. Um, so depending on the area, there's different ones. Um, down south, it's Farming Smarter. Um, out towards Rocky Mountain House, it's Gray Wooded Forge Association. Um, mm. I can send kind of all the links to all of them. Yeah, too, please that. do. But yeah, and it's the also the other thing I really like about those is it creates community. And I think that's also mm. a really important aspect when you're getting into to farming and livestock is to have a community of people you can talk to because it can be a pretty lonely road to go down. So it's nice, especially when you have losses, that you can sit there and talk to someone who's been in those shoes or similar shoes and mm -hmm. and you can share that instead of just letting it sit and weigh on you. So um, it's nice for, for meeting, yeah, other people in the area um, or seeing out yeah, what they're doing and you can sit there and pick their brain and yeah. yeah. So what other kind of uh, resources exist out there for, for aspiring regenerative farmers and agriculturists? It's kind of endless which is overwhelming in itself. <laughs> um, there are lots of really good Facebook groups out there. And mm. so like, I'm, I probably have, I'm on like, I don't know, dozens of them. Um, and you start to kind of connect with people. Uh, I've really connected with a lot of people actually through West Central Forge Association before I, I was working there. Um, we were mm. members and we've met some of the people um, that we're pretty close with um, and even direct marketing. There's two other farms we really work closely with. So if I'm out of pork, I will send them to another farm and yeah. vice versa. And we've really created uh, partnerships that way. Um, Open Farm Days is actually another really interesting one. Yeah, um, Brita, yeah. yeah you get to kind of go and see other people's farms and stuff. Um, I when we first got into it, I just kind of like cold messaged people on like Instagram. Um, I'd kind of search things, start following them. If I really liked them, I'd just message them and ask them questions. And nine times out of 10, they reply to you. Um, yeah. People are so receptive to that kind of thing. I love it. Yeah. And yeah, it's just kind of finding your own tribe. Um, and you, you do, you find it eventually, but um, there's, t there's tons of resources out there if you're willing to look for it. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you have any kind of final, final parting words as, as the interview or conversation comes to a close, um, any, any final words for aspiring regenerative farmers out there? If you're, yeah, if you're kind of going down the road of, you know, either you have land or you're wanting to get into it, really kind of figure out, yeah, what your values are how you want to do things um, and what your kind of goal is. Because, um, you know, when you come up with an idea and especially if you're doing it with a partner too, they have different values and ideas too. So if you've got a common goal and someone throws an idea out and you don't like it, you can sit there collectively and be like, does this match our goal and the values we set out together? If it doesn't, then that's a no. Um, so it's, it's just a nice way to be able to keep yourself in check a little bit. Um, making a plan, I think, is really important. And also equally as important is an exit plan. Exit plan. So if it doesn't work, what do you do? Um, if you are really starting to build, say, a ton of debt, um, what do you do? What's your way out? Um, those kinds of things. And then um, patience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of that I want to do everything at once and it doesn't work really well so like that's kind of where a plan kind of comes in handy is like okay we'll just start here and then like add together these different components instead of trying to do it all at once and then you're kind of scattered and not really doing anything great so um yeah yeah Patience and humanity. <laughs> thank you and, and thank you so much, Becky, for, for joining us today. I know I've, I've learned a bunch in this conversation, and I hope um, when we get this up on YouTube that some other people um, benefit from this as well, because, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities out there, and there's so many resources out there for people who are interested 
Um, and whether it's uh, regenerative agriculture that you're interested in or permaculture design in general, um, um, we are hosting a permaculture design course starting October 20th. Um, it's the same permaculture design course that, that I took um, last or two springs ago that launched me to get this job with Verge. Um, Becky has taken that same permaculture design course. Um, and so we'll include some information about that in the show notes below. That'll give you the, the foundation to start thinking through problems and in, in systems in the way that Becky's has, has done at her farm and, and other regen regenerative agriculturists are doing all around the world. So if you're interested in that, definitely click the link in the show notes below to learn more. Um, and if you do take that course, you'll be seeing um, some more of Becky in a few weeks for the, the livestock component of, of the PDC. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, me too. And I suppose that's that's bye for now. So for anybody listening, thank you so much for taking the time and we'll see you soon. Thank you.